You're listening to The Public Sector Show by Tech Tables, a podcast dedicated to sharing human-centric stories from CIOs and technology leaders across the city, county, state, and federal agencies, joining in the conversation and touching the hearts and minds of leaders across technology today. From mission-driven leadership to cloud, AI to cybersecurity, workforce challenges, and more, never miss insights from peers and vendor partners across the public sector. And to make sure you never miss an episode, head over to techtables.com and drop your email to subscribe. New podcast episodes come out every Tuesday and Thursday, along with weekly behind the mic newsletter. And one of today's podcast sponsors is Tech Tables Plus, an engaging new community where you can have early access to never before released episodes, early access to live event recordings, early access to weekly three interesting learnings, early access to live event ticket purchases, no episode ads and more, plus three extra special bonuses when you sign up today. Bonus number one, access to the CEO show. Bonus number two, access to the Higher Ed Show. And bonus number three, access to the Digital Show. Join Tech Tables Plus today. As always, thank you for supporting the Tech Tables Network. Today we have John Rogers, Director of Strategic Workforce Planning at the Indiana Office of Technology at the State of Indiana. John, welcome to Tech Tables. Joe, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm really excited. Today's podcast is sponsored by none other than the Tech Tables Live Podcast Tour. We've hit Phoenix, Austin, Raleigh. Make sure to visit techtables.com and check out the latest upcoming live podcast tours for all dates and info. And I got to give a shout out to my guy, Michael Petroika from Brooksource for the, for the introduction. I'm glad that he was listening to Tech Tables. Thought this would be a great conversation. So I'm pretty pumped on this. Now, John, before we kick off today's podcast, could you just maybe... For folks who don't know who you are, can you just tell the audience a little bit of, you know, your background? You've got an interesting background, right? Legislative aid, working at the CIA. Can I call you professor? Is that like you were teaching and now? I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've actually taught at this point now both at the high school level, more at the high school level. And then had the great opportunity in the spring of 2020 to be an instructor with IUPUI or better spelled out the Indiana University, Purdue University of Indianapolis. I was a guest instructor of sorts for their legislative interns during the spring of 2020. So I think I'd be a little pretentious to call myself professor. I don't think I have enough time to, to claim that one yet. But now I, I really appreciate that, Joe. And it's a real honor to, to be here looking at the roster of folks that you've had on this podcast to be in this category of, of government leaders. This is a real honor to join the discussion today. And my road was an interesting one. I started out teaching high school in Eastern Virginia and uh, was previously married and was with a spouse who had some moving around arrangements and had to essentially make myself my own skills-based hire and match my narrative to things that I was very interested in to create opportunities for myself. And so when I was leaving high school teaching, which greatly enjoyed. I was a teacher and a coach. I had great students. I can't say enough about the good people in York County, Virginia. I was moving up toward the Washington, D.C. area, and I had a mentor at the time who said, hey, you're really interested in Congress. And I had gone to undergrad with for a government degree and to get my teaching certification. He said, if you really are that interested in congressional work, like you, you better do it now between salary considerations and age, which at the time I was much younger and and didn't have a lot of family obligations. And I heeded that advice and quite literally knocked on doors for a few months to get my foot in the door with the late John Warner, who was the senior senator from the Commonwealth of Virginia and had the great opportunity of serving on his staff in two or three different roles over four years. And then, as I mentioned, spouse moved around. We wound up in Texas, and I took the opportunity to go back to school just because the timing was right, knowing that we had another couple moves ahead of us, and went to grad school during the time that we were in in Texas at the University of Texas at Austin, and mushed together. Yeah, that's an official term, by the way. Mushed mushed together my, my MBA 
and my master's of public affairs at UT and really knew that I was wanting to go for something where I could speak business to policymakers and policy to business leaders. That was the inspiration. While I was there, I was recruited for the CIA out of my public affairs program. They really liked the fact that I was that I had smushed that MBA in there. And so they were looking for folks to be involved in the business side of information management. And I was only too excited to to look at a role in the intelligence community and really knew that I wanted to continue to focus my career in the public sector. So found myself at the Central Intelligence Agency for over six years. So I have a little bit over 10 years in terms of government service at the federal level. And while, while I was at the CIA, I had, uh, had remarried and my, my wife, still wife, thankfully, we, we had just had our first child and we knew that we wanted her to grow up around her grandparents. And so that inspired a move, in my wife's case, back home for me, the first time living here in Indiana. But it was a tremendous opportunity to locate in Indianapolis and to change my public sector outlook from a federal one to a state one. And I had a great opportunity to join the Indiana Office of Technology Managing and their security team first. And from there, we had a chief technology officer who was really interested in starting something related to workforce. And I really felt a call to go back to my workforce roots that I had worked on a little bit at at the CIA doing recruiting and hiring and workforce development. And sure enough, here I am. This is my, technically speaking, it's my third position in four years here at, at IOT, but I'm really tremendously passionate about the work that we're doing here and the opportunities we're creating for individuals who are coming through our stay and learn program. The barometer through all this, I'm sure a much longer answer than your question, but my grandfather was in the fire department for 39 years and he was fire chief for the last 14 of those. And he was my, my real North Star for getting involved in the public sector and understanding that public sector careers are immensely rewarding, but also carry immense value for the public, for the greater good. Uh, Matter of fact, I'm, and this will be, I'm sure, readily apparent to a podcast audience, but I'm actually wearing one of his t-shirts under my shirt today, just to keep him a little close to the heart today for our talk and knowing that we were going to be talking about service. Oh, I love that. There was a lot there that was really great. So I'm going to, we're going to come to the grandfather piece in a second, but you said you were a coach and you were at a high school. I love this. If the audience knows, because I always talk about it, but I coach high school basketball. What did you coach? Tell us a little bit more. Right on. Sure. I coached JV softball. I was the head coach for a lady softball team, junior varsity for both my years there. And I was the assistant coach, assistant head coach for our men's and women's swimming and diving team. And of all the things, so I got involved with the swimming team because my mentor teacher at Tab High School, and give a little shout out to Jack Poland, Jack gently coerced me into being an assistant because he needed some help. And I was like, look, man, I haven't done swimming longer than I care to remember. Are you sure? And he's like, no, I've like, I've got the, I'm doing the teaching part. I need the administrative part. I need some of the support part. I'm like, all right, sure. And sure enough, the, uh, the first year that I was there as the assistant head coach, we actually repeated as state champions in our category in Virginia. It was a really fun opportunity to get involved in my first year of teaching and coaching and win a state championship. That was, uh, that was new. That's awesome. I think I've got it. It might be hidden behind my kids. Move the kids out of the way real quick. This past season, so I got to hold the CIF. We went to state. The varsity team went to state. Now, I also coached the, I was the head coach for the JV basketball team the last couple of seasons. Nice. And uh, I had a ton of fun. Now, it is a lot of work, especially also uh, (laughs) running tech tables. And so I was, I think one of the decisions I made for this upcoming season was to actually take a back seat and join the varsity team as an assistant coach. I sat down with the varsity coach. Some similar, a little similar conversation a little bit, but at this point now, everyone that was on the JV team had, that's on varsity now had played for me. And so the coach was like, Hey, look, I know you're super busy. You're traveling. I'll, we'll, we'll take anything you're going to give us. And 
that's like just being around, even if it's like once a week on the court is still so fun. And then last season was amazing. Just going on the bus with them. Once the JV season had ended and varsity kept going, I joined the varsity team and we had our state run and yeah, it was a ton of fun. And it's actually the high school I played at too, which makes it oh, pretty sweet. Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I haven't had the opportunity to coach now in, in a long time. I, when I was growing up in all through high school I had done volunteering with little league and just really enjoy softball that we didn't need baseball coaches at the time at the high school. And I was all too happy to get involved with the softball program. And, and then when I started my federal career, really the coaching went by the wayside, unfortunately, but something that my wife and I have talked about more frequently, and especially as our small children, we now have to start to get older. I think it'll be that conversation of like, Hey, if they're in a sport that's looking for help, I'm there because it's just, it's a lot of fun. And, and yeah, I just really enjoy getting involved and having kids be enthusiastic about the sport they're playing. It's just, it's just, it's very selfish fun. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I always joke that even though Tech Tables is literally what I do full time, this is my business. When I talk to people in the public sector, because people ask me, hey, like, how did you gravitate towards the public sector? I was like, I serve. I don't get paid for it. Or, <clears throat> I guess when you're the head coach, you get like a stipend, but after the number of meals you end up buying kids on the road when you're traveling, yeah. you're like, you, you make no money. <laughs> you're not in it for the money. Yeah. So that's my, how I have that like connection to just to serving. And I think too, like you get to see, especially with kids, you get to see a lot of, I think at a high level, especially like in the public sector, when I hear talk about broadband and deploying tablets and even workforce and when you're on the ground, like you're in the locker room with the kids and, and you're checking grades, are hey, you passing this class right now? That's when it mm -hmm. gets like really real of when kids don't have internet, what does it mean? It means they're just going to go do something that they shouldn't be doing. You, I feel like I can bridge the two worlds where there's like decisions being made and I talk to those people. And then at the same time, I'm like, oh, I'm in a locker room with these kids. So I can tell you how they're actually thinking about how this is like getting rolled out and that perspective. We could probably go That's three fun. hours, John. I'm not going to lie. I think we could go a long time. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm back for the next episode on that. That's fine. We can just do yeah. the discipline of sport and the relevance to public service, <laughs> a thesis. Yes. I love that. <laughs> and I actually love when people come back on. I, I think my, I had this same conversation with Renee Wynn, who's the former CIO for NASA, and mm -hmm. we just hit it off. And she's like, I got to come back for two or three more. The conversations are just too good. But okay, we're going to have you come back. Oh, we're yeah, going to have you come back. No, I, yeah, I, that's the problem. I think you, <laughs> any anybody who's around here on the floor knows that, that if you wind me up enough on anything in workforce, whether it's hiring, whether it's recruiting, whether it's trends, whether it's apprenticeships, I'm like Captain America. I'll go all day. And uh, gladly, I'll, uh, I'd be honored to come back if we, if we run out of time today. Oh, I love this. Okay, so let's jump because I do want to give you some time to jump into the SEAL program, the State Earn and Learn. That was a State Scoop Award winner. I love Thank that. You. What is it for the audience who, d who doesn't know? What is it? How is it helping people in the state of Indiana? Why does it matter right now? Oh, right on. Let's see. Let's take that first part first. So State Earn and Learn is a brand that was developed by our Indiana Department of Workforce Development under their Office of Work-Based Learning and Apprenticeships. And a big shout out here to Daryl Zeck and his team there for all the work that they do getting apprentices and work-based learners across the state of Indiana, any number of trades, of which we're one. And the Indiana Office of Technology came up with this great opportunity back in the fall of 2019. That was our kind of concept building phase of, hey, our colleagues at DWD are developing this or have been running this wonderful apprenticeship program. Why can't we do that to develop folks, reskill them into IT careers from anything? And we didn't take much thought to know, yeah, we absolutely can do that. It's just a matter of what training do you establish? How long does it take? And what careers would we expect these folks to fill on the back end? And so our uh, chief technology officer at the time, Joe Cudby, had talked with DWD about, about this as a possibility. And they were enthusiastic and Joe just needed somebody to go and get the job done. It happened to hit at exactly the right time where, again, I'd had a little bit of an epiphany about returning more to workforce responsibilities. 
and moved over under Joe to uh, to get this launched. And so the program that we've we conceived was actually originally to take 24 months, was built around some different technical certifications and intended to have people doing over-the-shoulder learning and hands-on tickets and really taking a very slow roll to getting people integrated from whatever walk of life into a public sector IT job. And then the pandemic happened. So quite literally, for the state of Indiana's first executive order day of Hey, go. That was my first day of bringing folks into our program. My pilot with two seals. And quite literally, it was a hey, guys, we're going to get you computers and we're going to get you set up and we're going to make sure everything works. And then I'm going to have to tell you to get out. And I'm also going to have to tell you that we're going to play some things by ear. I don't know exactly how everything's going to go just yet, but we will figure it out. And I am here with you, and we're going to make sure this experience works. Very quickly revised my playbook. And basically what I'm about to share with you now has been the secret behind what we've been doing ever since then. And that's over roughly about a 12-month concept. We bring folks in from any other area of employment, really literally anything. Over 12 months, provide them with industry-valued certifications. So, for example, the CompTIA package of A+, Network+, Security+, YSA, Project+. We've used the Microsoft Azure 900 exam. We also have some folks who've made it through the AWS Cloud Practitioner Foundations. So we bring them in. Over 12 months, they get typically two to three of these certifications. We target them toward a role in the Indiana Office of Technology. Our now, thankfully, more back into a physical slash hybrid approach of being on a team, doing tickets, doing the work hands on really from day one. That first year was interesting because we had to facilitate a lot of virtual sort of, hey, these guys aren't working in your work. Can they come shadow? Can they network with people via Microsoft Teams? What experiences can we get them? And then it wasn't until August of 2020 that I was able to get my first two associates their first hands-on experience here in our deployment room doing break-fix hardware during the pandemic. And to their credit, I asked them, I was like, hey, we have an opportunity. It's going to be on site. You don't have to take this because we understand people's perceptions. And we're, think back to what we were all thinking in August of 2020. We knew very little, I think, really. And they jumped at the opportunity. They said, we're here for this. Ever since August of 20, we've been running folks on site, at least in part, integrated with teams at IoT, getting hands-on work while also balancing their week. They literally get to study on the job. They get paid on site, on the job learning that's balanced with the time that they're spending on their team. So they are always either earning or learning over the course of the state's 37 and a half hour of 40 hour week. And the goal is that at the end of about a 12 month program, which is flexible, that they are eligible for conversion from a attempt to hire contract status into full state employment with salary benefits and otherwise that interim period while they're on the program, they're partnered up with our vendor partner, Brooksource. And again, yeah, shout out to Mike Petrarca for, for being a part of the great Brooksource team that we've been with since the inception of the program. They help us with talent pipeline. They help us with the holistic coaching and mentoring model that goes to the success of our people and shaping them into extraordinary government employees over the course of their time on the CLIT program. I'm very happy to say that as we're talking right now, I have four individuals who are sitting in their first ever state orientation, having graduated our program on Friday and have moved over to state employment today. And we, in the short amount of time that we've been around, so I'll clock back to our first onboards in, in, in March of 2020, we've now hired 40 people into the program. We started our most recent two associates just last week, and we've now graduated eight into state opportunities. Our retention rate is exceptionally high. I think over the course of the last three years, we've only lost three people, and thankfully, it's been amicable. Yeah, I just love 
I love this story a lot. And I think part of it is finding, and you said from any background and bringing them in. When I hear and research about the workforce, the labor force problem, it's all over the news, right? It's like hiring issues, can't hire anybody. No one's out there. It's impossible to find anybody. I love the openness and mindset that you have. Now, How? where did that come from? Because I think that's very rare to have that mindset of, Anyone I run into, it could be an Uber driver, it could be a Starbucks worker. What do you see where you're like, they have it, I see something in that person right now. They may not see it in themselves, but I see it in that person. Yeah, Joe, that's a great question. And we really do have folks from so many different ages, backgrounds, occupations, professional experience, folks with families, folks without, just really it's, it is a very diverse group of individuals. And I think some part of that comes from experiences that I've had in life where, you know, again, I consider myself a skills-based hire. I've done some things educationally for sure, which have helped with my employment. But that said, my resume walk looks a little scattered. And I've had people to, over the course of my life, to, to sit down with me and say, hey, wait a minute, you've applied for this. What? Tell me why again? What is it? For example, when I came on board here at the Indian Office of Technology, it was like, wait a minute, like CIA, you're, and you want to do what now? Like you're coming here to Indianapolis? Oh, yeah, yeah. Family. And I think this is a great opportunity with security. Okay. But CIA, what now? And so I think about my own journey and I think about the tremendous potential there is out there among people who have been working jobs but might not have ever really had a career opportunity. And I'm fortunate because I get to hire in a space that, you know, is arguably, and I don't really even think this needs a strong argument, this is the single most important area of really any business, any government organization at any time, and especially right now, we have to have strong IT and we have to have strong IT in the public sector. And I think there's a lot of demystification that can go with that. And I really think it's something that's accessible to so many people. And I got this great experience when I was hiring at the CIA that we weren't hiring people from necessarily from spy organizations to come be spies. We were hiring people from other walks of life in to translate those skills into being an intelligence community hire. I learned there that hiring doesn't have to always be get the person who has the most years of experience in, in the thing to come do the thing again. And that's great. Sometimes that works. It's always wonderful for us to have somebody who's done 18 years of private sector server administration to come on and join the Indian Office of Technology. Super. Love it. However, that's not the case for us. And we're, as a public agency, we can't be closed to any paths to get us talent. And this just happens to be one where I knew that we had an opportunity. And I knew that if we gave people the right opportunity in a space, that they wanted to be in that was critically important, that we would really win hearts and minds from the outset, that they would want to be here in IoT, they would want to continue their careers here with the state of Indiana. So a great opportunity just to give them that foot in the door that they need here in the IT space. We have a ton of great organizations across Indianapolis who have focused on providing folks with whether it's coding skills or training, we're taking that an an extra step. We're providing the training, but also the job on the back end. And that's the thing that's been so difficult for the pandemic for people to get. They can get some skills added. And I knew that we have a number of occupations in IT where people just need it. They need the passion and the enthusiasm. And we'll pour the kerosene of skill onto that fire and to really take advantage of their determination. And we've, I can't say enough about the great folks we've had. My graduates today, the folks who are sitting over at our other government building right now, getting their orientation, one was a cross-country truck driver, one was a line cook, one was a restaurant manager. The other had some experience doing technical writing, and we brought him in to do the same for us. But we've given him the opportunity that he really 
couldn't get previous to us in terms of getting his foot in the door with a career opportunity. My other four folks that graduated the program since inception, one was a army veteran and probation officer. The other one worked at a hospital. I had one gentleman who was a factory worker and the other used to work on arcade machines. And now those eight individuals, no particular order, are now a state penetration tester. Two of them are working front lines, customer service for us on our help desk. Two more are in security operations in the security operations center concept we have. Another is working on a solution in our vulnerability management space and security. And the other one is doing is that lead, helping lead break fix hardware out of our deployment room. These are all people who in about 12 months time for each one of them have all shown that they absolutely have the capacity to contribute in an IT organization. And we're very fortunate to have their talent here. Yeah, that's, I love that. I, and I think, you know, I love that you were a coach and because I think when you're a coach, you, you see this with kids and it, and I just, and I love it. And especially on the JV team, right? Where every year you get, typically the best freshmen will move up to JV in whatever sport. And then any of the JV that are really good are going to move up to varsity. So you're constantly getting a new influx of people in there, of new kids in. And then the best kids leave a year later <laughs> to go play varsity. And what I love is, though, every year you come in and it's basically a new team. And you have to try and figure out how can you get this team to win together? And it's a fascinating concept because even if you can go out and say hire the best coder on the planet, let's just say you can get the best database, you can get the best cloud infrastructure, you can get the best AI expert. If you don't have a team, it's still not going to go anywhere. And right. I love illustrating it when the kids beat more talented teams because they played together and they figured mm -hmm. out if we play as a unit, then we can go win. And it's the same thing in organizations, exact Absolutely. same thing. And I love that when you're able to bring in the organization, understanding like, this is a starting point. We're bringing you in. It's part of a team. And then you build them up, their skills grow. It's just a fantastic story. So I love what this, what you're doing, what the team is doing, training people up and getting them exposed to technology. Because once upon a time, I wasn't always running a technology podcast as people love to. Oh, you must have been doing this since you came out of diapers. No. Once upon a time, I sat in a room at a company called Yardy Systems, which is a property management software company. And uh, walked in the room and this guy, Rob, was the team lead. I had just got hired, pretty new, I'm I think 21. And he's, I didn't know anything. And he's drawing a database and a web server on a whiteboard and telling me how this goes together. And I'm like, Rob, I don't know what you're talking. You, you might as well be speaking a foreign language to me right now. I know a little bit of accounting from college. I just don't know. I couldn't even tell you how to spell SQL at that point in my life. So that's how <laughs> funny that was. And then now I ran into him at a Starbucks in town. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, this is 13 years later. Yeah, 13 years later. Oh, I run this technology podcast. And he's in no way. <laughs> so it's just but like a know, funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I, but but the, in that space, you're talented and you could learn it, which is exactly what we see out of the tremendous folks that we bring in here. I, it's interesting you mentioned the JV example too, because the more I think about it, our <laughs> I, so our varsity and our JV teams played on the same days, just on opposite spaces. So if we played a high school, the JV would be, for example, uh, on our home field, and the varsity would be playing away. That was basically the model we had. And my varsity coach was notorious for putting fifteen to eighteen girls on his roster for game day which meant that as a JV coach, I'd have to beg and plead for him to just at least leave me with one pitcher. Just please let tonight not be the night that I have to like really teach somebody how to pitch. Let's just not, let's not do that. <laughs> do whatever you want. Otherwise, let me talk to you about how you could please maybe not take my three, four and five hitter. Other than that, like you're, you were the, you're the big varsity coach. I'm just the little JV, but like at least give me a, a fighting chance. But it's interesting, like you, you take those opportunities when other young ladies are called up to the big show 
to play with the varsity team and you need to plug in folks sometimes in positions they're less familiar with sometimes in spots in the batting order they're not familiar with and say hey you know what you're here and i have confidence in you we can get this job done just go out there and do your best and honestly that's exactly the same thing it is here on our seal program i'm confident in them I know they'll, they're they're going to go out there and do their best. As long as they hang with me and we just get in there and know that we can contribute together, we're great. Yeah, you know, I love that. Some real psychology on this one. I hadn't, hadn't thought back to my JV roots in a while. Yeah, no, I love this conversation. I, I love this. Cabinet. No, I, I love this. I think there's a lot of, again, Tech Tables is a human-centric po- technology podcast. It's human-centric. This is like perfect, right on the theme of it. Uh, Joe, I'm honored to just be a part of it. Okay, John, if you had 15 minutes with the state CIO, any state CIO, to convince them that the workforce innovation taking place in the great state of Indiana needs to happen right now or in any state, what lessons or insights would you share about rolling out the SEAL program that are most critical? That's a great question, Joe. It's when we launched the program in terms of concept pre-pandemic, the biggest thing that I was looking at is the data from the state and local government executive space. And I believe that that organization has rebranded, but the indicators economically that public sector IT employees were deferring retirement at, and again, this is a little bit dated knowledge because the study that they conducted was between 2008 and 2018, we had retirees opting not to defer. So basically, hey, I'm eligible for retirement. And all these folks historically had been waiting. Toward 2018, what we saw is the trend was going in the opposite direction, that people were instead opting to go ahead and drop the papers. And for an organization like ours, a public sector IT agency, providing service as the backbone to to all of Indiana's executive branch agencies. If I were to pull our retirement numbers right now, probably somewhere right this minute in the 15% area. And if you just start projecting that out over the next one year, three years, five years, I'm quite certain at the very least we rise up above 20%. And if, now again, a little asterisk related to the pandemic and all the economic conditions over the last three years that have maybe changed people's mentalities a little bit. But I truly believe we're going to start to go back to where we left off in 2018. I think we, we had basically a little a pin put in that. So I'm pointing our state's CIO and would point any state CIO back to those numbers to say, hey, look, we're those of us that are in the state and local space in public sector IT have to be infinitely cognizant of the number of people we have eligible for retirement and all that these folks have gone through over these last two and a half years that really probably felt for most like they were 15 years long. You've got a lot of folks out there who no doubt are grandparents who have family considerations, and they probably are going to be more likely to say, hey, retirement's looking pretty good because I don't think if I, I don't think I really want to get yanked around anymore in the space of all that's going on in life. It's time to enjoy retirement. And as those folks have a rosier economic outlook, I think they're going to be much more likely as they were back in 2018 to drop those retirement papers. And we can't, any of us through in public sector IT, can't afford even the beginning wave of people dipping their toes into that particular ocean. Because once it starts, the snowball is could, is there. It could really happen. And there are probably a lot of people who see that as chicken little. But I don't think so. I think we look across the landscape of state and local e-practitioners and we see folks who if they're retirement eligible odds are good they probably don't want to change up technological approaches three more times over the next year or two years and that's not to say that it's a closed-minded approach at all it's just more I, i think about where i would be in that stage of my career if i had the choice of retiring 
versus, oh man, do I really want to stick around and try to learn three more cloud approaches? Do I really want to do this? I might want to do it for a little bit, for a few months to just kind of see the landscape or train the person that's coming behind me. But you know what? I think I'm probably good. And and I think we're all due for that sort of retirement reckoning. And the second that that starts, those of us who are in this in the public space who otherwise have to compete with private sector offers that might be able to offer 2x what our pay bands have and full remote work and go sit on a beach somewhere and work for three times the money. Like we, we can't compete with that. We have to compete for those whose hearts and minds are really in the public good. And as those individuals start to retire out of our workforce, if we're not prepared day one thereafter, all of a sudden we're all going to see this immense brain drain out of our workforces. And that's going to be very quickly powerful. Yes, yeah, this, this is a this is actually a fascinating topic. I haven't really dived too much into just on a research base, basis, but yeah, this I'm yeah I'm a little bit scared, right? You think about the number of folks who are yeah. retiring. When I was in North Carolina, I was interviewing Rob Bain, who's the state chief privacy officer, basically CISO there in North Carolina, and he was saying. They've got like 21,000 job openings just in cybersecurity mm -hmm. across the state that they're trying to fill right now. And we just had a fascinating discussion around just like the talent pipeline that he's trying to build very quickly to fill in. But even this at 15%, and even if that drops a little bit, that's it's pretty heavy, especially trying to get the new folks up and running as quickly as possible and keeping that retention rate high enough that it offsets what the attrition rate is for folks who are retiring. But I did love what you said about competing for the hearts and minds. Dwayne Shell, when I had talked to him a couple of times, he's the CTO for the state of North Dakota. I'm 99% sure I might've got that. I'm pretty sure I'm 99% sure. I'm going to double check. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, I'll just cut this out of the podcast, but fair enough. yeah, fair enough. <laughs> exactly. He wouldn't even know we had this conversation right now. So he had talked to me about, yeah, winning the hearts and minds. And same thing, I had this same conversation with Corey Wilburn, who's the CIO for the Texas General Land Office, because it's just impossible to compete against the private sector dollar for dollar. It just is not going to happen. So especially when folks are offering 2x, 3x, but I think this being able to compete for those hearts and minds is what is going to keep people in, not only engaged in their work, but also willing to stay for the long haul and train the next generation of people or even participate in the SEAL program in the state of Indiana. I had a great, another great conversation actually with uh, Kevin Gilbertson, who's the state CIO in, in Montana, about his approach in Montana of having this kind of first in, this younger generation is coming in and working with the younger generation and having the older folks work with the younger generation and, and the older folks who are there, I say older, don't no one who's listening kill me that I'm using the word older. The older folks, the more senior folks, there we go. I'll go to the more senior folks. I, I like to go with seasoned. Yeah, seasoned, seasoned. I'm gonna go with that. Seasoned employees. I like this. So the more seasoned, seasoned employees are investing in the younger generation and, and the goal is to have the younger generation give them maybe four to five years and then circle back around. And when their seasoned employees give back to the state, I know he's rolling out a program like this is, I think there's some, a lot of really great stories, but everything, a lot of folks are trying to address. I didn't actually, the, the stat, I, I'm like super curious now. So after this podcast, I'm going to go, I'm going to go jump in and figure out what the actual stat is of that brain drain, that eligibility for retirement, that retirement wrecking. I think that's a conversation that probably needs to happen more. So I definitely thank you for bringing that up, John. Yeah, and, I, and I, like as far as the direct correlation to for state earn and learn, because we actively and enthusiastically recruit a diverse group of individuals, people who may be newer or even brand new in their careers. My my youngest SEAL employee started with us at 19. My And on the flip side of that, I have some folks who have been in the workforce for 20 years. Now, I want them both here through the SEAL program because they're, regardless of how long they've been in the workforce 
so far. I want them spending the remainder of their career, whatever length of time it is, with the state of Indiana. So as long as those folks are helping us to carry the effort forward, if we invest in them and their opportunity, their learning, their growth, their development, their work experience now from jump with our SEAL program, then hopefully these are folks that, and what I tell them on the program is I'm excited about them today. I'm excited about the first day state or learn associate, but I'm even more excited about the five-year person. I'm excited of what, where they're going to be in five years in the organization, because I know at that point, they're going to be really contributing back. They're going to be leading. They're going to be, as you said, they're going to be leading others in those roles, whether it's in the program or on teams or what have you. And I want this to be a place where somebody who has one year of work and 20 years of work that they see in IoT, the place that no matter what, that's this is where their path is and their destiny moving forward so that we're all continuing to advance and succeed in the public IT mission. Yeah, I, no, I love that. And I was curious around the concept of skills-based hiring versus degree-based hiring. When did you maybe first come across that thinking? Did who in, like You have a master's degree and so typically, I think the mindset would be, we've got to hire people who've gone through this formal education. But when did you start believing there's a difference between skill-based degree and, and, and or skill-based hiring versus degree-based hiring? Like, when did that first kind of idea come into your mind of, hey, you know what, there's a population over here, they may not have the degree, but we can skill them up. I was curious, like, when that first started for you? Yeah, a big part of that was in... Over the course of 2019, dating back to about 2019, uh, IoT had made some connections here locally in Indiana with individuals associated in and around the Markle Foundation as an extension of their partnership with Microsoft. And they had really tremendous data on the impact of skills-based job descriptions and applicants and focused in particular on Indiana and IT occupations, being able to show that, for example, that when a potential employee sees a degree requirement in a job description, that individual, even if it doesn't say required, Let's just say it's maybe the first bullet or the second bullet, and it says something along the lines of preferred or strongly preferred, that individuals here in, in our economy were seeing that, and they were 70% more likely to go ahead and skip that job posting. doesn't matter what else is on the page. It doesn't matter if it looks and feels like a perfect fit. If the individual saw a degree requirement, maybe they had a high school education and years of experience, vice a bachelor's or a master's, or maybe they had an associate's degree, vice a bachelor's degree. If they saw that stipulation at a different level than what they had, they'd skip. And once we saw that information and really started to understand where we were going, even in, again, going back to the retirement numbers and retirement eligibility, we here in the public sector can't afford right out of the gate 70% of people skipping on our job descriptions and skipping on our application process. Just really, that's basic math. I don't want to start with 30% of potentially great hires. I want to start with 100%. And if it's something as simple as removing the bullet that says you have to have degree X in this, well, look, that's the easiest thing in the world. Instead, we lean very heavily, at least from the IoT perspective, and we were able to bring our state personnel department folks to the table with the same data. And I think we've had a really good conversation around it. But from IoT's perspective on this topic, we truly believe that it's about finding an individual who between their educational experience, their work experience, their certification skills, whatever combination of factors there are, that's the way to get at a qualified candidate, not just stipulating you have to have that bachelor's in computer science, period. You have to have five years of experience, period. Let's look more holistically at the individuals who potentially could really fill our roles. 
And then on top of that, with our stay, learn, and learn IT program, showing that we can build those people up from near scratch to, to do exactly that also, that we have somebody, two people that just starting Monday, if we go back to June of 2021, they're both in the restaurant industry or one was in a healthcare provider sort of restaurant environment and the other was a pandemic retired restaurant manager. Now they're both on our security operations and they didn't have four year elevated degrees didn't have 10 years of cyber behind them, but they're absolutely contributing today to the mission of Indiana in terms of providing cybersecurity for the state. Yeah, no, I love that. And my, uh, my last podcast event, live podcast event in Raleigh, talking to, 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 to this Uber driver, who's my Uber driver, and his name was a Sim. And I'm talking to a Sim and he's telling me, hey, Joe, I'm trying to crack into tech. I said, oh, okay, cool. What does that mean? What does that like? tell me more? What does that look like? He's got nothing. He has no idea what I do. And uh, he's like, oh yeah, I'd love to get into data science. And I'm like, yeah, just keep telling me more. He's like, oh yeah, man, I'm just looking for a shot. I'm just trying to get out of Uber right now. And and $50,000 would, would change my life, would change my world. And I said, you're, you're right. $50,000 is a big jump from hustling around. And I was like, cool. So what are you doing today? And he's, what do you mean? What am I doing today? I'm driving. I was like, if you want to stop driving, I'm throwing this live podcast event. There's going to be a bunch of folks who are in the public sector, who are CIOs. I've got some folks who are some vendor partners. I don't know. Do you just want to show up? And I'm sure they're, they might have an opportunity. And, and it was awesome. I don't know what happened. I just opened that door. And so Sim showed up and he's, I didn't actually tell him the dress code. It was great. Everyone's dressed up super nice and he's wearing like basketball shorts, shoes, and a t-shirt and a hat. And I was like, <laughs> I love this. And he's walking away. He's talking to Jim Weaver and he's getting business cards and numbers and referrals and leads for jobs. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I love this. This is great. So yeah. I, I think yeah. we just need That's... more of that, of identifying the right traits of people mm -hmm. versus give me a cover letter which I think personally, my own opinion is, I think it's just really boring. It's a lazy way. If I'm going to be a little aggressive, I think having conversations with people is like the best way to start to get to know a person. And then you can mm -hmm. really feel, you can see, Hey, I think this person would fit really well over here. Yeah. Yeah. I think I agree to disagree on a well-crafted cover letter. It's got its time. <laughs> and its place. It's we're, we'll leave that one aside, but yeah, I really do feel that you're absolutely right for folks who have an uncommon but not unrelevant or irrelevant, shouldn't say irrelevant, unconventional is a better word. People who have an uncommon but and an unconventional path to something. And I've been in this same place where I've applied to things and it's, hey, I know what you're going to see on paper. Like when I went from high school teaching, to the United States Senate as an aide there, I, I'm teaching high school. I had a BS in government, but I hadn't pursued congressional work right out of the gate. And I had to tell a story of, well, hey, what, why are you changing geography? Why are you moving out of your the town you're in now? Why are you coming to Capitol Hill? Why not keep teaching high school? When you have an unconventional path, you need that conversation to tell your full story. That, that would be an exquisite cover letter. You got to show me an example. I got to see an example. Yeah, yeah. I got to see an example of these yeah. cover letters because I only see. Snail. All right. You got to we'll, give me a great one. We will. We'll set this up for another episode for <laughs> sure. Joe and John talk, walk through cover letters. Yeah, yeah. Um, I and you know, I think that for folks who are taking unconventional paths, anytime you've got, again, that shot, right? Anytime you've got the foot in the door, anytime you've got the thing that you need to just, let me talk to you for five minutes max to just tell you a little bit about what's going on so that we can develop that connection. Yeah. And that's extraordinary. That's fantastic with the Uber ride. I mean, that's, that's giving somebody their dream shot. So I'm immensely happy because I feel like in my job, I really get to do that every day here on the program. Yeah. La last piece on this topic and then I'm going to transition to the next question, but I coaching and you're, you're a coach. So you see this, you just meet, so many different people, kids in my case, from different backgrounds. And it's amazing that once you get to know, like the surface level, you would just maybe pass on them. But 
underneath that, it's just it's just really inspiring the number of kids who that what they can bring out that they didn't know they had in them, which is uh, I think one of the great joys of being a coach. And, and I get it; you can't get to know every kid. Just it's like impossible to get to know every human on the planet. But I think just taking a little extra effort and time, like with what the state of Indiana is doing with the SEAL program. And I think it goes a long way because you don't just change one person's life. You end up changing the circle that they're in. And it just is just like this branching effect mm-hmm. that I absolutely love. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the central belief that I have with Tech Tables is that that it's really about people first, which I'm actually really excited that you are willing to come on. Sometimes people get scared to come on Tech Tables because they think I'm going to talk about data lakes and uh, very highly technical pieces. But it's really just about sharing. I would also be scared yeah, to I'm scared too. Data. I, I, I'm really scared too. <laughs> that's, that's right. And so I love sharing the, these human-centric stories. And one of the things that, that uh, we t- touched upon it again today, but touching the, the hearts and minds that inspires someone who maybe is a cook or a restaurant worker or an Uber or Lyft driver, that they could make this jump in this transition to cloud, DevOps, cyber, data science, to, to making an impact. And now I was a little, I was younger, out of college, I was working at a hotel and I was unloading a truck at a warehouse before I made a jump <laughs> into, into Yardi systems. So I'm constantly thinking about those stories in my own head, but or maybe it's like a few of your favorite stories of where maybe you've seen the seed of belief transform a cook or an Uber driver into someone who has a new path because they were exposed to the world of technology? Sure. Man, I tell you what, we in earnest at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to be trite about it, I could literally pull up any of our 30 plus hiring stories among our CLIT associates and read a paragraph out of it and you can make a whole episode just on that. I, we might have to one of the at ones, some point. We, I am game. Well, you want, we'll, we'll, if you're going to be here in Indianapolis, you will just, we'll sit you down with the whole crew and we'll just record testimony. Oh, I love that. But uh, one, one of my associates mentioned to me, really super bright guy, and he's now a, a just graduated the program and he is, he's now a seal, excuse me. He's now full fledged security staffer serving in our penetration area, penetration testing of our security team. And he had been a long haul truck driver. And he mentioned that when he got his opportunity on this program, that his old boss had told him something along the lines of positions probably still here when this fails out in a month. What do you mean? Well, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to get that. That's not going to work out just so you know. So when you come back, we'll figure something out. Not even, Hey, best of luck. Hope it goes well, but just, Hey, you're going to fail. And when you do see you back an approach and knowing how much he has contributed since that time to our organization and, and how much that that was that was never going to be an option for him in our program. He came in the door from day one, Brian Sutterfield. He, a matter of fact, he was even one Brooks Sources Associate of the Year across all of their apprentice type employees, all of their kind of contract type of folks uh, last year. Incredibly proud of Brian not ever letting that become his mantra and instead taking every opportunity that we gave him to excel and to be a strong contributor on our security team and really help us lead the way on penetration testing. And he's got a tremendously bright future ahead of him now. Never in a million years would I have thought that he would have flamed out of our program. That just was not going to happen with the kind of mindset that he brought, the kind of heart that he brings. And I think about that a lot when other folks, we've had somebody to come in and interview for us and get fired from their old job because they had to take the day off or the afternoon off to come in and interview for SEAL. And we've had folk who've been told by other supervisors, like, hey, you're, if, you call, if you call out tomorrow, you're done here. And I just I can't fathom that kind of treatment of employees. Doesn't matter what sector you're in, just the fact that these, these are other human beings. 
and they're doing work for you. They are contributing for your organization. Why not Why not treat them with respect and dignity and humanity? And if nothing else in this organization, we're absolutely getting that. But I'm proud of all that these folks have sacrificed to make the leap into public sector IT and all that they contribute every day to take on that learning and take on the opportunity and never look back and see us as a uh, much stronger employer of choice relative to what they were doing before. Going from a collection of jobs to collectively careers here in IT. Yeah, that's, that's, that is a fantastic quote. Yeah, I've got a couple thoughts. One, it's just a fantastic story. I love that. Two, I think at first, I don't know if I was like a little naive, but I think at first I was like, oh no, no one gets treated like the way you were just describing at the end. Of, and then I started <laughs> have friends and other people meet with me and they're telling me stories like this. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah. there's a lot of, there's, it's a, there's a lot of poor leaders out there. I would fire them. That's right. <laughs> I, I would fire those leaders. And it's just a, for, the hard part is the culture always starts at the top. And when the culture is just one of, we're going to just fire you. If you go do this, we're not going to support you. And yeah, I think the kind of, maybe in the last five years or so, I've just heard so many stories from friends or just offline or got, grabbing a beverage. And it's really disheartening that there are a number of organizations that allow this type of just culture to fester. And, but again, love the flip side of that, of what the state of Indiana is doing and a number of other folks. I think that's an opportunity in the public sector to grab talent where people are maybe overlooking it or just not valuing that talent. Again, just great story. And I had a great podcast with this guy, Austin Allred, on episode 77, The Risk-Free Degree. I don't know if you've caught that one yet or not, but- uh, Only a piece. Only, only a, piece. a piece. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll confess. Yeah, yeah. I know I dropped it last minute to you, but so he leads Bloom Institute of Technology, formerly Lambda School, and their whole premise and business model is actually- skilling up folks who maybe don't have that traditional education and doing mm -hmm. it in an efficient and quick way. And with how they do it is they front the whole cost for them. And then they only, I think it's like, there's a couple of years where it's like a three year or something payback of like a max of up to 25%, but you got to be making like at least, I think it's 50 or $70,000. Phenomenal program. He, he, if I think if I was telling some of the guys who coach, I had coach who left the varsity team and graduated high school who were going to local city college here in Santa Barbara. I'd met with them afterwards and they're working some jobs in town and going to school. And I seriously encouraged them. I was like, here's some areas, explore, maybe take a different path. Don't feel like you have to do this like traditional route. And I said, basically go interview like 35 people and go hear their stories. I've got friends who graduated college and majored in Spanish. And they work in real estate now. I was just like, all of my friends, like anything they did, there was like anything they're doing right now is not anything that they went to college for. And then technology is just one of those where it's like this ever changing game and right. innovation. And it's just, it's exciting and it's fun. And how do you stay on top of that? And especially where the world's changing so quickly. So yeah. I think if you'll humor two thoughts on that, because all great points, I think even going back to your Spanish to real estate example. I think even for those of us, and I, again, I was an undergrad for government and state and government. So maybe I'm the unicorn. I don't know. <laughs> you're a unicorn. But yeah, you're a unicorn. <laughs> Thank you. My daughter will be very pleased. <laughs> so I think even from my classmates who were in technology related areas 20 plus years ago in undergrad, even if they went that path, if I think about now what they'd be working on, what my colleagues here who are roughly my kind of workforce time peers here in the organization, honestly, that's not unlike Spanish to real estate. If you think about how dramatically the technology has changed, even in the last 10 years, and I think for any of us who want to test that theory out, go talk around someone who is at or around 30 years old or younger and use, use words like zip disk or floppy and watch just faces of horror and amusement. So even for the, the tech is so rapidly changing now, we might as well all be going from Spanish to real estate, <laughs> quite frankly. We have to have that like professional and learning agility. And I think really what 
we're all better served to do no matter where we are in age, no matter where we are in career, no matter what our circumstances are in front of us. If we all take half a second and think, what really constitutes my perfect day? What is the thing that brings me the most joy in work? I know some people like to say the, what would I still be doing if I was doing it for free? What would I do just because I love it so much? But assuming we all do to put food on the table, provide for others, what have you. I really think about like the, everything for me is an opportunity cost away from my kids and my family. And what are the things that in those hours that I'm not with them bring me the most joy in work? And that, that for me is the workforce development piece. It's bringing the opportunity to others. It's connecting them with these careers. And if we all just take that half a second, and for anybody that's out there and maybe right now they're driving an Uber and they think, man, Everything that I hear about this cloud technology sounds like the greatest thing in the world, and I want to do that. It's not as simple as just ripping that Band-Aid and going and do it, but pretty close to it. Like, the time is now. Pull the car over, yeah. <laughs> start Googling the right programs, and find your lanes into your passion, into your joy. It's going to take a while, I'm sure. And you have to find the right people and the right opportunities, but we're all better off for taking that time to think about it and then taking those next steps, whatever they may be. It's I'm very fortunate because all the times that I've taken the minute to reflect on that, I've been able to work them out. Um, a unicorn. Yeah, no, I love that. That that was a great, that was a great closing piece, John. I really like that. The last piece about the whole floppy disk thing that you were talking about. I am laughing. I was just having this conversation with my, my daughter. Let's check, man. Here she is. So she constantly, Annabelle over here, constantly is making fun of me. She's oh yeah, you're like old. You had that thing called like a Blackberry. What the heck is that? And I only know what, oh, I only know what oh, an yeah. iPhone is. And, yeah. and so I was helping her hook up a video game system to the TV. And she was like, what did you... How did you, we just stream stuff now. What did you, I was like, oh, yeah. there's this thing called a VCR. Yeah. And then before that, and she would be like, so what's a VCR? And I was like, what? Exactly. I have oh, no exactly. idea yeah. what it is. Oh, Zero yeah, quick. yeah. And she was like, oh, 100%. Yeah, pretty funny. And I would tell her the old like AOL dial up. This is like vintage. Right? Heck yeah, man. Yeah. My, this is legend. Yeah. I was just like, this is when I started to learn like, to experience any form of coding and hooking up networks. And I was doing this mm -hmm. in Elwood Elementary School. And uh, I was trying to explain this to her and she's no idea. She's like, why are you doing these weird sounds right now? And I'm like, no, what? How? So the world oh, has changed. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. If you think, I, I'm, I'm sure your kids are probably the same. I mean, my, my kids are not quite two and then one just turned five. And even they have the concept of touch screen lock. Like they just, no, my daughter's first day of kindergarten, she gets a Chromebook. I got my first computer, and I don't say that like reliable computer, but like one that would actually be used for things like to send an email, which I say as because at that time it was of dramatic import to send an email <laughs> yeah. like that. And that was my like back half of senior year of high school. And it wasn't really until I was in college where you had to have one. And now you got people walking around with something that's three, three X this size. Whereas I like forget about a laptop and my desktop was, I'm fairly certain made partially of lead because the thing weighed about 300 pounds. But like you just, the, <laughs> the fact that they can carry they're computing from one room to the other and forget hooking up video game systems. You just swipe and cast it onto the TVs now, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. Come on. And these, these phones are so funny because I remember having this giant gateway computer and this thing was a yeah. the tower yeah, on go. this thing. It might have had two towers at the time. It was just like the hall. My grandfather like helped us haul this thing in yes. and yeah, just yes. great memories. Okay. So, anyways, John, we're. I, we could just hang out all day long and hopefully at some point we'll have the chance to, where can people find you online if they want to connect with you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? Like where's your spot where you like to hang out? On? Honestly, LinkedIn's probably the biggest area and I'd strongly encourage anybody to find me there. I accept with 
pretty much everybody. I'm always happy to connect with folks about opportunities. I'm happy to connect about shared experience. I'm for whatever it may be. LinkedIn is my jam. Everything else, I where possible, I shy away. I only uh, only use Instagram mostly for things like uh, tattooing and eighties toys. So. <laughs> yeah, nice, love it. So if you want to find John's yeah. secret tattoos. You can head over to Instagram. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no. So LinkedIn, love it. And appreciate you coming on Tech Table. This is a ton of fun. Twice, actually. That's yeah, coming back. Real honor. No, I am. I'm very humbled to be a part of the Tech Tables crew. And you've got a, you've got a subscriber. I am. I'm enthusiastic about the discussion. I look forward to the future hang. Love it. You're listening to the Public Sector Show by Tech Tables, a podcast dedicated to sharing human-centric stories from CIOs and technology leaders across the city, county, state, and federal agencies, joining in the conversation and touching the hearts and minds of leaders across technology today. From mission-driven leadership to cloud, AI to cybersecurity, workforce challenges, and more, never miss insights from peers and vendor partners across the public sector. And to make sure you never miss an episode, head over to techtables.com and drop an email to subscribe. New podcast episodes come out every Tuesday and Thursday, along with weekly behind-the-mic newsletter. And one of today's podcast sponsors is Tech Tables Plus, an engaging new community where you can have early access to never-before-released episodes, early access to live event recordings, early access to weekly three interesting learnings, early access to live event ticket purchases, no episode ads, and more, plus three extra special bonuses when you sign up today. Bonus number one, access to the CEO show. Bonus number two, access to the Higher Ed Show. And bonus number three, access to the Digital Show. Join Tech Tables Plus today. As always, thank you for supporting the Tech Tables Network.